Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Leaders In and Leaders In Business, November the 20th. We are absolutely honored and delighted to have you with us today. I do just need to cover off a few rather boring housekeeping matters, but they are normally boring, but I'd like for Orange, actually, then show you an Orange ad which covers off far better than I can, housekeeping point number one. Hi, I'm Leticia Preciado in Hollywood, where Orange are enhancing the movie-going experience once again. Specially trained phone guards are now on hand to ensure not a single text or call is made during a movie. Are you you're bagging my phone? Yeah, we're just going to bag your phone this way. It will not be a distraction during the movie. Whoa, popcorn! We got a P97. Excuse me, back away, please. Over here, sir. <laughs> Hello, Leticia. Hi, really? Clear. I really do see myself as a guardian of entertainment. They're on the screen doing their job. I'm in the theater doing my job. Without me, nobody gets to enjoy them. Ma'am, I will pat you down. I will pat you down to Chinatown, all right? I don't think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll play patty cake, all right? And I'll be the baker's man. Sniffing dogs provided to us by Orange. No difference really between them and us other than their dogs. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't be alarmed. I'll be releasing a member of our canine strike force into the theater. He'll be sniffing out any cell phone signals. Cookie, heel, cookie. You are making me look stupid. Enjoy the movie. Pretend we're not here. Cookie. No, you shh. Get the point, right? <laughs> uh, but if you could just turn them on silent, that would be uh, that would be absolutely fine. I'd like to now um, introduce our speaker to you all. He has held many senior positions around the world. Uh, including some great companies like Compaq and Hewlett Packard. He is known as one of the leaders in not just telecommunications, but also in business. Uh, and we're absolutely delighted to have him here today. Since joining everything everywhere as it was back then, uh, he has done an absolutely phenomenal job in merging both T-Mobile and Orange. And he's also done a phenomenal job at changing the name from everything everywhere to uh, the great name EE. -E. Uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And he's the man that is bringing us the 4G network here to Britain earlier and faster than anyone else. So I'm absolutely delighted and honored to welcome to the stage Olaf. Olaf, welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. We now are called EE, so that's quite uh, exciting. We were called Everything Everywhere. What I like about EE is that it's short and snappy, and it's a, it's a name that is a little bit easier to uh, a sell with, you know, and um, to use. E today is the uh, UK's most advanced digital communications company. Uh, we have uh, recently launched the first 4G network, but we're also the first to offer super fast fiber here in the UK. I've promised that I will not um, give a sales or a marketing speech about my products and my services. I will talk a little bit about 4G, just briefly, um, but then of course I will talk about leadership experiences over the last 18 months. And I'll try to keep my remarks short so that afterwards we can do a Q&A and, and, and that you can, you know, that I can share as maximum, you know, maximum amount of experiences with you so that you can use that in your business where you uh, think it's uh, the right thing to do. Um, but one, before I start, you know, uh, uh, what is 4G? Because it has been in the press a lot. We have been talking about it a lot. 4G is a much faster network, it's a better network, it's a network that is, um, uh, you know, that, that, that has to be in the UK because the UK is an economy that is more dependent on the digital infrastructure compared to other countries. And when I arrived here, I'm from Holland, from the Netherlands, but I've been living here now for just over 12 months. I felt, you know, when you are the largest in this country in uh, infrastructure in mobile infrastructure you need to make sure that you have a great infrastructure uh, that you bring to the market to the country to the society um, for the years to come and especially in a country where uh, the infrastructure overall is not very good I mean I, I lived in Switzerland before I came here so it's a bit of an unfair uh, comparison and the infrastructure in Switzerland is very good but very expensive it's much more expensive than here, but um, uh, I, I do find that the infrastructure needs in some parts of the country a bit of an overhaul. In fact, just before I arrived here, I was talking to my wife and she said, uh, we are out of warm water, we are out of electricity, and uh, it's an apartment which is um, not the cheapest in the city, so I was a little bit surprised. That's just one example of infrastructure not working. 
So when I started here, I said to my organization, you know, if there's one thing that we're going to do is we're going to do something about the infrastructure that we can influence and that we can work with, and that is a digital infrastructure. The digital infrastructure is hugely important. It is very exciting to work on that, and it's something that um, you know, will stay for years to come and that can really give an economic benefit as well as a financial benefit to uh, my company. And that is behind the transformation of EE and the story that I will now tell you. So first of all, the background of the company, it is indeed a joint venture. Um, it's a joint venture owned by France Telecom and Deutsche Telekom, so 50-50. Uh, we have no more financial funding from those, so we have arranged over the last 12 months our own financial funding. So we are financially independent and we are a UK PLC but with a board and with the unusual model where we have only two shareholders rather than many. Um, now, most joint ventures fail, as you probably know. 60% um, fail um, according to the experts. Um, there are many reports on joint ventures, um, but indeed there is not a long history of successful joint ventures. And one of the reasons that this joint venture so far is doing well and is improving and has a very good future is because it is a fairly conservative joint venture. It's a joint venture initially built around synergy and cost saving. And everything else is upside. And that's very different from many other joint ventures that have been launched. If you think about joint ventures like Sony Ericsson is a good example. I don't know if you know that one or even uh, a joint venture like NSN. There are many joint ventures that are not only built around a synergy plan, they are built around a new product, a new service, something new that will drive revenue in the, in the, in the outer year. So the first reason why it is um, uh, a good joint venture because it's built around a fairly conservative synergy plan. The second is because it is a joint venture between two parties that are working together in several areas. So it's not, an, it's not in isolation. So when we have a problem in the board, and of course you discuss problems, but the team has to figure it out. You can't walk away from the problem because there is too much at stake outside this JV as well as inside this JV. And that's something that most people don't know. DT and FT have a lot of other relationships at the same time. And the third very pragmatic reason why this joint venture has worked is because it's actually quite a nice atmosphere and we know each other very well, it's a small team. I came from France Telecom or from Orange. I was heading Orange International and I was in the board already before I took this role as a CEO. So the, the relationships are good, it's a small team and we like working together. So, and that's also of course very, very important when you uh, build a successful JV. Now, what we have changed and uh, in the beginning of this year, is we moved away from purely a synergy story to a real integration and leadership story. When I arrived here, I, I mean, I was struck by the fact that the company, like many telcos around the world, ha had lost focus a little bit on their core products and services. Uh, telecommunications company around the world are making a lot of cash with their existing businesses and they're looking very often out of the window to companies that are taking other revenue streams and that are very successful as well. Companies like Apple, companies like Google, um, content companies and there's always a very big appetite to do something else because the grass will be greener outside the core business. And this was in the company where I, when I arrived definitely also the case and because the profitability in this country is significantly below other markets in telecommunications there was also a sense of we need to sweat the existing assets we need to make sure that we minimize the capital expenditure to secure dividends and cash flow for the future to a point where the networks the core of what we do were a little bit neglected you know and, and that's just in the industry overall. When I arrived, I, I can I, I'll never forget, I mean, the, the second day, I was sitting down with my technical team and I said, so how is my product doing? And um, they said, well, it's doing fine. You know, it's uh, green, green. We can show you the benchmarks. 
So I looked at the, all the KPIs, you know, I will not bore you with all the details, but there's a lot of KPIs behind the network, and most of them were green or ember. And I said, well, I recognize the colors, but I don't recognize the benchmark you're using, because from where I come from, I think it shouldn't be green, really, it should be red. And literally, it tapped me on the shoulder and said, Olaf, you're from Holland, you're now in the UK, you have to compare yourself with your competitors here in this market. In this market, this is fine. And I said, that's not good enough. I mean, if we're the number one, we're not anymore the number three or the number four. We are merging into being the largest in this market. We need to have a fantastic network, a network that sets us apart, a network that the society, the customers deserve. Because if we want to keep 27 million customers on our network, the one thing that I am sure of is we need to give them a great network experience. Otherwise, they may leave. So, very simplistically, that was the start of establishing the vision and the plan for the company, was to deliver the best network and the best service so that our customers trust us with their digital lives. We explained it to our employees, and I think that was the trigger point for unleashing a lot of activity, work, and positive movement forward to a new leadership position in the market. And um, my suggestion around this one is the leadership learning I wrote down for myself is it is important if you have a big transformation, if you have a big plan, is to create a single vision and a goal of where you want to go. And that single vision and goal cannot be just a financial goal. Most plans that I see are always financial plans. If you say, we're going to hit seven billion pounds, you know, let's print the t-shirts, let's put it on our caps. Let's go. That, you know, the employees don't get so excited about that. The top management will. But to get the employees behind your plan, you need to tell them why they're coming to work. And it can't be just to make some money. There is something more. And in our company, we were able, not with everyone, but with most people, to say it must be exciting to build something that will be there for generations to come, and it will be better than the competition. And that's what triggered the change in my company. And the first thing it changed was that, of course, the technology teams started to become more the focus of the company. Um, and we have, you know, there is also funny things in that area. You know, the people said, but we already do a network. We know, you know, it's you know, it's there, so you know, what, what, why, what, what, what has changed? What, what, what do you want us to change? And I said, the first thing we need to change, we need to understand what it really is. Because if you walked in the marketing departments of EE, and I'm sure the same will be true in my competitors' um, uh, outfit or, or companies, is that the marketing people had, you know, I want to ask the question, so what's, what's 4G? What's the difference between 4G and 3G? Now, most of you won't know that, and I understand that. But a marketing team in a company that sells network, they should know that. And the answer was, well, we understand the pricing, the tariffs. But, you know, so, so there was a lot of change, really, just about going back to what we really are supposed to do. And it was not only network, by the way, it was also about service. So we have 10,000 people in the UK working with customers on a daily basis. And I said, if the network is great, that's not just the hygiene factor, it is really important if we can demonstrate that it's better. And then true differentiation will come from the way we interact with customers um, in our call centers, in our shops, over the web. Um, and, and that was the second pillar of our vision and strategy. And to make that come to life, very simple, was to start changing the focus of the company and, you know, in every company scorecard, the customer is at the center of what people do, right? I mean, it's on every PowerPoint. You always see it. And yet most companies don't really live it. And it's hard to live it. It's hard as leaders to live customer centricity. So what we did was, after we had announced the management team, um, uh, you know, in the company, we just spent time with customers and more importantly with the people that are at the front line or so the people that are interfacing with customers and we try to really live this change in 
you know, instead of seeing an organization as a pyramid where I'm at the top and the customer and the people who support it are at the bottom, is to turn it on its head, is to really say our actions, our priorities in the leadership team have to come from the people who are closest to customer. And I try to live this, and it's really hard. I mean, and it's sometimes really painful because, it, first of all, it costs a lot of time. Of course, it costs a lot of time. <coughs> Um, uh, and you always have something else to do. You always have something else, uh, else to do. But my recommendation this is my second, you know, leadership learning is try to make sure that you talk to your customers on a regular basis. Like one example is um, this morning, beef. I called. Um, um, I did the second round of calling of five customers that are on our new network since one week. So just pick up the phone and I call them. And I say, I mean, most of the time it's, a bit, it's first you have to explain who you are and they think it's spam and they think, you know, you're going to sell something. It's really difficult. And then when you tell you're the CEO, they don't believe it. <laughs> <coughs> but I can tell you, I learned so much from that. I learned so much more from that than sitting in my ivory tower with managers who tell me this is what you should do or this is what you it's amazing the clarity that you get, not from every conversation, of course, but from many conversations. And especially, I learn most, and this is fantastic in my job where I work, is I have people working with customers directly, and I can go there. So I can go to Wales, I can go to Greenock, I can go to Newcastle, and I have hundreds of people phoning customers all the time. So I can just sit there and listen, and sometimes make signs to the agent and say, you're saying something wrong, you know? <laughs> Don't do this! But I can recommend you do that, okay? Um, and if you start doing it, which is interesting, then other people uh, you know, start doing it as well until the point where then the whole organization comes back and says, oh, we need to structure it better, formalize it. But that's my second learning, and I think that's a very obvious one, but it has helped us to become more customer-centric and to do something with s building a services image. Now on 4G for Britain, um, this, is, this is an interesting story. Is I, started, I already explained to you that the, the industry that I came into was an industry that um, was more focused on sweating the assets. And the UK mobile industry, because of its profitability issues, typically five to ten points difference with mainland Europe, um, was behind in its infrastructure. On the other hand, and this is the contradiction, is that in the UK market, the consumers and businesses are adopting new technologies in my industry faster than in, in Europe. It's very strange. So the number of smartphones, the number of new applications, in this market, it goes much, much faster than in other markets. So there is this uh, uh, imbalance. We knew that it was going to be really hard to convince the um, authorities to move forward and allow us, and I'll, I'll spare you all the details because it's a little bit complicated, and this was one of the issues in my industry, that there's so much jargon and, and you know, difficulty that at, this, at a certain point in time you can just lo lose it and, and, and actually take the wrong decisions based on, on all the uh, 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 jargon. So, the situation was that we wanted to use our own airwaves that we have bought from the government several years ago to introduce a new technology, to innovate. I said to the government, this is really what is required if you want to move the industry forward. The initial feedback was, well, no, because what really brings the industry forward, which, which is what the industry has said for many years, is you have to deliver more airwaves and you have to sell those to us. And the rules of those, of, of, to get those airwaves is so complicated that that's why the UK is behind. There are delays because the rules are difficult and it's not fair and this and that. So we have been squabbling over the rules of an auction for many, many years. I explained, and this is, uh, that the real reason is not the rules, but it's because there is no appetite to invest. So you can always find a reason why you don't like it. And I explained 
to the authorities that if they want to get this thing moving, they have to allow me to start innovating because I have to innovate because I'm the number one and I have 27 million customers on my network. And if I innovate, the others will have to follow because there is competitive intensity and that will drive capital expense investment in the UK. The capital investment that is required to get 4G across this country is five and a half billion pounds. This is excluding buying airwaves. It's massive. It's massive, including the, 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 the spectrum that needs to be bought. It way, it's way higher than the Olympics. Olympics, I think, was seven billion. So it's, it's, it was a big, big investment. And initially, it was difficult to, to, to get uh, uh, that understanding. But I said, and this is, uh, this is why I tell the story, I said, I think this is so good for the society, it's so good for my customers, it's so good for you, I'm so convinced that it drives the industry forward, I'll just do it. I'm not going to wait. So I went to my shareholders and I convinced them to invest one and a half billion pounds in the UK over the next couple of years. And that triggered the change, in my view, that triggered the change because I said, you know, I'm just waiting for some paperwork. It makes sense. So go and do your homework. I'll just start investing. And my leadership learning here, my recommendation is, you know, well, it's obvious, uh, but sometimes you have to take some risk. Yeah. So you have to take some risks. It's also a bit more fun. It can be at times a little bit. Uh, the most difficult thing was that Actually, you know, you constantly have to tell 15,000 employees that this will be done, that they, have, they don't have to worry about it. The only one who has to worry about it is me. So you have some sleepless nights when things are not going exactly in the direction that you want. Because, of course, it was a risk. I mean, if you build something and then, you know, you can't use it, um, it becomes a bit complicated with the employees. So I think it was a risk that I could take. I'm glad in hindsight that I did it because that has given me the possibility to be there where I am now with a great network and with a big advantage over the competition. But also it has delivered an acceleration of the auction. The auction is now taking place in the beginning of January. So it has moved the whole industry forward, which is great. So those are some of the things I wanted to say. I want to leave you with one more because otherwise we don't have enough time for questions and answers. So one other learning that I've had is about integration and cost management. And it must be, must be interesting for some of you because I think some leaders, of course, are involved in complicated integration. We had a very complicated integration to do in addition of building a network. So we had to integrate Orange and T-Mobile systems, people, cultures. Uh, my CFO always said it's like the Ark of Noah. You know, in our company, you have everything is two. So you, you know, you have, Two, two, two IT systems, two, two warehouses, two everything. Um, and there's a lot of merger principles, but the one principle that I would, would advise and recommend is a principle that allowed us to move very, very quickly within 12 months, is to use what I call adopt and go. If you go in a merger process, you open up the boxes and when you ask people what system are we going to use, for example, people will have the natural reaction to say something new. We need something new because this is old and this is older. So we need something entirely new. And in fact, it, this happened in our case. We had several projects, especially in the IT area, but not only in the IT area, where there were new things that were planned. And when you do that, you will significantly slow down and risk an integration because you're going to spend a lot of money on something new. You're going to de, you know, you're going to 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 to, to um, leave to other systems, and you lose a lot of know-how. So what we did was we say every decision in the integration is going to be adopt and go. So we will tell our teams and organizations you only have two choices: you select between Orange and T-Mobile, or a combination of the two, but you can't select something else. And and that allows us allowed us to to do something which was not so much in the press, but which was as difficult as building a network, was actually to, in, to create 720 stores that could run Orange, T-Mobile, and our new network services. So we sell three brands 
uh, from basically a situation where we had a T-Mobile shop, an orange shop, specific system, specific people, only 350 on each side, and now we have doubled our capacity and integrated behind the scenes the systems to support that. And those systems are not ideal, they're a little bit old, but they work. So with that, I would like to uh, take your questions. Thank you. Olaf, thank you very much indeed for an inspiring, really inspiring uh, presentation there. So um, if we can just uh, start with uh, what we did uh, with Neil as well, the quick fire round, just to get to know the man behind the presentation and the CEO of EE. Uh, and that's just to sort of, you know, sh really short uh, quick fire um, questions and answers. Number one, what is your favorite restaurant in London? <laughs> I have a lot of favorite <laughs> restaurants. Uh, the one that I like is the, uh, what's it called, the Blue Bird? Blue Bird, I Blue like Bird, very much. Blue Bird, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like that yeah. one. I go there ha yeah. frequently. Prince yeah. Harry goes there as well, I'm sure. I, I didn't know that, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> and then I like a few in, uh, I live in Richmond with yeah. uh, my, my Swedish wife and uh, three children. And there's very nice places around there where we go. Um, like tonight, we will probably have to go there because we don't have hot water, so we will <laughs> probably... <laughs> <laughs> please stay in this country, please. Yeah. Um, what, what do you like to do to relax on the weekend? Um, well, I like to be with my children, yeah. uh, but I also um, love endurance sports. Um, so that's depending on the season. So here it's mostly running and uh, cycling, but I love uh, uh, cross-country skiing and... Uh, uh, swimming and all yeah. long distance stuff and mostly on my own. <laughs> on your own, okay. Yeah. Gives you some time to think. Yeah, no, no, no competition, no. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I like it. It's presumably yeah. in the office you don't get much time on your own. No, exactly. It gives me, I mean, the, the, the leadership trick that I've used many times is, the, the, is my sports because it gives me a time to relax yeah. and to think really. Uh, yeah. I use that time normally, so I go. I, I, I try to sport every day, yeah. about not long, thirty minutes a day, That's but that me. gives me time to, you know, to yeah. just reflect and take decisions. Fantastic, good insight. Um, last two, how does it feel um, to sit in the cinema and watch some of those very, very cool orange ads <laughs> when everyone is laughing their heads off? Yeah, that's really I'm good. the CEO of this company. Is that? Well, the guys who have developed it, I think, are sitting in the audience somewhere in the back. Uh, it, it's, that's really cool, actually, yeah. especially when you're with your kids. It's really cool. Uh, what is also, I had a really cool moment uh, last Saturday, which was really nice. I, because I, I spend so much time in the stores and on yeah. the front, with the front line, most of the salespeople, they know me. So I was walking with my uh, two daughters and uh, we went into this, one of the stores because I wanted to know how things are going. And I, I asked them quickly. And my daughter says, oh, wow, that's really cool. They know you and they talk to you. And these important shop managers, they really uh, help you. And they thought it was absolutely fantastic. That was a uh, nice, nice moment. But on, this, on the cinema, you know, yeah, yeah, the, these ads are really cool. And I love the Kevin Bacon. Have you seen the Kevin Bacon ads? They're pretty cool. They're pretty good, no? I think they're really, they're really good. It's playing in your offices. I went around to the EE offices and there it was. Very yeah, cool. yeah. No, it's, uh, I think that this worked well. Yeah. yeah. Just bring, presumably it's quite expensive, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, let's talk about, you mentioned 4G. Uh, let's bring it to life. This is a quick fire round question. So just quick answer. What's one of the coolest things we can do with our 4G phones and our 4G network when it comes about? Um, well, it's already there, by the way. So you can use it now. So you can, you can go to your stores and get it. It's fantastic. 11 cities works very well. London up to the M25 works really perfectly. The feedback from the customers that I spoke to is they are very positive about the network. Some have had issues to, to go through the process because we had some you know, initial issues with the IT systems that not everything worked perfectly and there was a lot of people who we had to work through. But without any exception, all the customers saying, wow, this is really cool. And the application I like most is, is just watching uh, TV programs that I didn't have the time to, to watch because you, you watch them, there's no waiting. So you just click on it and bang, it comes up. And it, yeah, so, so that's, that's pretty cool. And the coolest application for business is not yet in this country, and I hope that I can get it here, is an ambulance uh, application in Germany, which is basically a 4G application in the ambulance that allows people that have like heart, uh, heart issues um, to, ha to be, uh, helped in the hospital much faster because they can send from the ambulance 
they can send much bigger data files, like uh, scans or mm. all the data across to the hospital. So it cuts the time from um, uh, getting into the hospital to being operated by 50%. And I, I thought that was quite a fantastic business application mm. uh, in healthcare. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. Um, just, just on the brand thing, just to clear that up if you can, Olaf. So we've got um, Everything Everywhere Trading now is EE, which owns Orange and T-Mobile, which is half owned by Deutsche Telekom and France Telekom. There's a lot of telco brands in there. So um, yeah. is EE now going to replace the other two Orange No, no. So, so basically, we never really uh, marketed everything everywhere. I mean, yeah. if you would ask a customer in the UK, they, would, they wouldn't know who, who what you know, what yeah. that was really, they didn't really answer that. So, so what we trade with is EE, Orange and T-Mobile. Okay. T-Mobile is straightforward value, you know, yeah. very clear, very, you know, straightforward uh, value. Orange is for, for those customers that say, listen, I want to have more from my mobile phone, so typical extra cinema, you mentioned it before, yeah. you know, cinema and other things, loyalty points. Mm -hmm. And then EE is just super fast, you know, is okay. EE is about 4G and fiber. Right. And that's what we sell and support. And, um, uh, uh, you know, and it works well because, you know, I know that everyone in all the, the experts and the analysts and they always say, you know, why do you need these, these three? It allows us to be not one size fits all uh, in, in, a, in a society where there is a lot of different needs and requirements. Mm. And mm. if you have 34 percent market share, you know, it's kind of hard to mm. reach everyone with one, mm. one proposition, really. Okay. Got so you. we will maintain three propositions. Okay, makes sense. Um, just a quick one on, the, you know, on coming up with EE. Obviously, it's an acronym for everything everywhere. It, it was that always? I mean, who came up with the idea? It's a very smart idea, and I love the application for G. <laughs> well, <laughs> the uh, so you know when you when you um, try to find a name, yeah. you the you think I thought because I haven't done this before so I've never really had to go through a mega rebranding and find a new name you think the process starts with oh I can pick a, a kind of a, a nice couple of names yeah. it's in it's quite a boring process because you actually have to find a name first that legally fits and I can tell you most names are already taken so if you if you try to find a name for your company uh, you know most of the names are already taken in the world and then the second thing is all the research is pointing to the fact that the name needs to be simple, short, easy to remember. You need to put something behind the name that really makes a difference internally and externally. And that's the difficult bit. That's the difficult bit. So finding EE was actually really easy because we asked, I asked a lot of the frontline people you know, what, what, what would you like? You know, what is easy for you? What is simple? What do you think can be easily marketed? And most of the people said, you know, it is hard to say on the phone, we're working for everything everywhere. And, yeah. um, you know, it costs time. Yeah. So that's why we, 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 we push this name EE. And what we had to do behind the name is establish also, of course, the vision, but then some values that represent the new company and that is more important and more difficult to do than finding the name. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I can recommend that if you, if, you, uh, uh, if you go through something like this, you need to spend quite a lot of time making sure that the values of your company are values that you can really live by, that you can really market internally, mm. and that uh, where you're absolutely convinced that they also make sense in driving your propositions to the market. Yeah. Just quickly, top two values? So we are saying we're bold, yeah. we're brilliant, yeah. we want to be brilliant, yeah. we aspire to be brilliant. Yeah. Should have been called BB. And we want to be clear. Yeah. So we have three, three values. Okay. Uh, we want to be clear because we think that building a fast and good service proposition to our customers, we need to demystify and simplify and be much clearer in our products and propositions. Yeah. So that's why we want to be clear. I said we want to be bold because sometimes we need to take risks, mm. we need to be entrepreneurial. When you are a leader, <coughs> you need to be innovative and you need to push ahead. And to be brilliant is more a state of mind of trying to go the extra mile at work every day. It's to really try to make every day, I guess, a good day. Um, that's about, you know, 
being brilliant and trying to get that little extra performance yeah. in yourself and in the company overall. Well, if you're surrounded by uh, a great management team and yeah. great leaders, you have to be, otherwise the CEO is in a lot of trouble. Um, so what do you look for? What do you believe makes for a great leader? I think the first thing that I, I always looked for is diversity. So uh, it, diversity I always found very hard to manage uh, because it's a little bit difficult if you have this team of different people, mm. different backgrounds, uh, gender, uh, age, culture. I mean, you need to have differences in your team and it's very hard to manage because in be the beginning it can be quite conflictual. Mm. But I've got a, I have a lot of ex good experience with teams that are where everyone is completely different. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I keep this picture of my first management team on a wall to always remind me, search diversity. And when I look at that picture, and I was very proud because I thought it was a very good management team, although I, I mostly inherited that team at the time. Um, that team, when you look at the picture, I mean, everyone looks completely different. One is like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, and, and I think you get power in your company if you have diversity um, from the top down. Mm. Representing the sort of socio-demographics of the people you have as your consumers, presumably, as well. Yeah. Um, let's just say you've got one of these great leaders, uh, and they came to you and said, what is the one piece of leadership advice, Olaf, that you would give me? What would that be? Uh, that's difficult. Because um, I already said a few things. But uh, um, the one leadership advice. Can you ask me the next one and then I'll, I'll come back to that? We can come back to that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's talk about uh, you for, uh, for a second um, and your own leadership style, Olaf, mm -hmm. if we can. Uh, the Daily Telegraph said um, that you are a no-nonsense but likable Dutchman. Presumably, you wouldn't uh, disagree with the likable component of that, but what, are they, what, are they, what do you think that they mean by the no-nonsense? Well, um, my style... Uh, is very open and I try to be very pragmatic and I try to be uh, I try to be driven by more by numbers than by words so uh, so I, I, what I don't like is these very long powerpoints or research mm. or you know I, I always believe numbers tell a very clear story and then from numbers and from an open discussion you can find out um, what the key issues are and what you have mm. to work on. And then uh, uh, no nonsense is really about, you know, getting, roll up your sleeves and, and work on those issues with your team. Yeah. Try to be, well, the, the, the environment where I can't work, where I find it really hard to be successful is a political environment. Mm. So, you know, I think you always have at times in your career, you have had situations where you said, oh, this was very political. Yeah. And I'm very much the opposite and I have, big difficulties working in, in, in that sort of environment, where there's yeah. people with agendas and where, where it's not a real clear, open, transparent culture. Yeah. Is that avoidable, you think? Because a lot of people say, I hate politics in my company. How, how can you practically prevent that from happening, if at all, <laughs> just focus on the numbers, I presume? Well, I, I, uh, I, I think one of the ways you can avoid it is by constantly go back to the people who are definitely not political, which yeah. are in my company, the people who deal with customers, they are not political because they have to solve a problem from a specific customer. And so they, they, they don't have an interest. No. So uh, I, 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 can, I can give you a quick example. I, we were working on some big issues around um, call propensity. I will spare, the deta spare you the details, but and we spend a lot of hours with different teams and it's very difficult because it's cross-functional and nobody really wants to tell, well, the problem is really there or there. Yeah. So then I spent uh, last Friday a full day in, in the call center in Merthyr in, in Wales. And <laughs> when the agents were free, uh, we had some lunch, uh, they asked me, what are, what, is, what are you working on right now? And, and I said, well, we have this big problem and um, I can't work through it really. And then, you know, they said, let's work on that. And um, we spent 20 minutes discussing it. And we got more out of that discussion <laughs> out of the whole management meeting because it was a completely unpolitical environment. Yeah. They said, well, it should be like this or it should be like that. So that helps me to avoid politics. Excellent, excellent. Um, Olaf, talk about that. You are, you know, leaders have to make tough calls, right? And when you first came in, um, 
to the merger, T-Mobile and Orange, you mm. made some tough calls. Uh, in fact, there's, it was widely reported in the, in the press that you laid off half the management team. Yeah. I don't know if that's an accurate number or not. Uh, but tell us about that, sort of where a leader has to make those decisions as well as inspiring and everything else. Well, I, I, I generally, I don't like to, um, uh, to, you know, to, to uh, reduce employment or to, uh, have to tell people that they have to leave. But I, I had to do that because we had far too much management in our company. So we had 26 people reporting to me and it was still uh, very much a, you know, arc of NOAA situation. So you have two management teams, which in the beginning of a joint venture is actually a good thing to have because you don't want to immediately lose the knowledge. And it takes some time. I came more from the orange side. It, came, it, it takes some time to understand the other side and to appreciate. Mm. I, I have worked in mergers where the first day the CEO comes in and said, bang, you know, everyone out. And what you end up with is actually you lose many times a lot of talent immediately. So. Mm. It does take some time, and I had the opportunity. This was my advantage. First of all, I've been working with the joint venture for some time, and I had worked with Tom Alexander to prepare already for some changes. So I could move fairly quickly mm. uh, in making, I think, the right decisions. Right. And then to take those decisions, I find is hard, but if you treat the people ethically and you are frank and open, I, I, I think it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as you said, you have two of everything. Right? Yeah, yeah, at that time. time. Not guess. anymore, not anymore. So <laughs> we, we went through that very quickly in the beginning and we yeah. had to do that. Yeah. And if there is one advice, to come back on your previous uh, uh, point, there's one advice I can give is, um, when I was announced, uh, I was still in my old job and I wanted to go on vacation and spend some time with my family and then come back and start and doing the general, you know, the first 30 days mm. and then the next 30 days listening, deciding, implementing. And the employees came to me after I was uh, introduced and they said to me, you know, you need to move very quickly on this and this and this because this has been hanging over the company for a long time and everyone has made promises before that they would deliver it at this, in a certain point of time and because of issues with shareholders or complicated, it wasn't done. Mm. So then I started thinking, actually, this company has to be faster in delivering plans so why don't I set the example? So I then said to the team, I mm. will be here on the first day and announce my team on day one. I will do that on day one. So the reaction immediately from all the employees was, he will not do that. He will not be able to do that. <laughs> he's going on vacation. He's still on an old job. You know, he will not do that. And then, which was very good actually, because I, I, well, it was not very good for my wife and my family because I, I actually didn't have any vacations. So I was preparing all the time and making mm. sure that you don't shoot from the hip but you take the right decision. So prepare that. But then while I was working, I was thinking, I actually can enhance that. I, can, I know there's two other issues that are really burning uh, platforms. So why don't I try to solve those as well? Or at least mm. that they are nearly uh, uh, ready to switch. So when I come on the first day, I can say, I've done this. Then I can do an employee roadshow and say, what's the next issue? And if they then say, well, it's this, they say, oh, I'll, I'll fix that in a week. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it was not a week, but two weeks or something like that. And I did that. And the reaction was very positive because then suddenly people say, oh, no. So, so this guy, he has delivered immediately his first team. Okay, but he worked during the vacation, so fine. You know, we, we got that afterwards. Yeah. Um, but then during the employee talks, I said, well, you know, we have uh, this issue. Um, or they said, do you have this issue? I said, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it by um, next Friday. We'll fix it. I said, but uh, you know. So next Friday, it was fixed. So then people said, okay, before we now ask a third thing, maybe he is allowed to ask us for something. <laughs> and with that, we could actually accelerate the execution. Mm. Because then this, the people start thinking, hmm, yeah, okay, mm. we need to move fast. Um, so it, it's, I guess it's the... Lead by example, you know, yeah. you, you, if, if, a problem, if, if, if there's a problem around execution, make sure that you, that you execute much faster than people expect, yeah. a couple of times, uh, <laughs> with some tricks sometimes. And then uh, you really lead by example and you force the organization to move on that particular problem. Just to give you an example as to Olaf's execution 
uh, detail. I've been told that he can helicopter right up to the, to the top to look above the organized, the sort of the landscape, the competitive landscape. But also, to, I had a real life example. I was trying to call EE, trying to find out the head office number to, to give your officers a call. Um, and I called and I spoke to somebody called Wendy in one of the northern call centers up there. Okay. And um, I, I said, I'd like to have Olaf's telephone number. And she said, why do you want it? And I said, well, because he's going to speak for us. And I just want to speak to his communications team. Um, and she said, You're, he's speaking for you? Is this, are you joking? Is he really speaking for you? I was like, yeah, he's really speaking for you. And then he quotes, Olaf is a great CEO. Uh, as he really does come and talk with us. In fact, he listens in on my calls. It totally freaks me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it just shows how hands-on he is. That's a, so presumably it's a very important thing. To <laughs> I don't remember w Wendy, but I'm, I've, I spend a lot of time with them. And, you know, I, ca I can tell you here, you know, because we are all leaders in some shape or form. But what, what people do who are working in the call centers today is absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing. You, you know, these people don't, you know, earn a lot. They come out of university or sometimes they have been in those call centers for years. They, it is amazing. They have to solve problems. They have to be a psychologist on the phone because everyone who phones a call center is somehow irritated and wants to get an answer mm -hmm. immediately. They have to work with different systems. We have asked them this year, we don't want you to transfer the call. We want you to solve the problem. You must solve the problem. You're not allowed mm -hmm. to transfer the call because people hate that. Um, so they had to train in operating systems. I mean, it is amazing what these people have to do and go through. I am, every time when I'm there, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, how do you say that? Yeah, I mean, proud of what yeah. they do, but also uh, blown away by what, what, what these people can do mm. in sometimes very, very difficult circumstances. Well, that empathy you just mentioned obviously comes across to Wendy because she, uh, yeah. she pointed that out. Um, if we can just move gear just quickly on risk taking, you mentioned about corporate risk taking. Uh, 4G was due to hit uh, the UK in 2014. As you mentioned, you went to the authorities, you got it. 2015, early. 2015. Actually. Earliest, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you've obviously been able to bring it forward by persuading or whatever you, you, you were able to do. But it is a significant risk for both for um, you know the 1.4 million pounds a day you're investing yeah, into yeah, the absolutely, network. Yeah. And also potentially for you yourself as the CEO yeah. driving that forward. So from your perspective, you know, tell me about that decision because there's, pro there's benefits of being first to market, there's also benefits of being second because yeah, you can yeah. just learn from the s mistakes from the first and be the seamless, smooth operator and go in second. What uh, I, I guess by taking risk and um, at times, uh, of course, it, it, it was very stressful because I was not always sure that we were going to be able to deliver it. But to be able to say to, to your team, when they asked me, at times they said, but what's the plan B? And I said, there is no plan B. So that was quite a refreshing because it, it, it I mean, of course, the, you know, potentially we, we, have, we would have continued, but it was not a real plan mm. B around leadership and uh, if we wouldn't have been able to activate and drive our network. And that was one of the reasons why all the teams were able to deliver because everyone started to understand what is at stake. Yeah. And um, so I, I, th I think it was uh, good to do that um, in, uh, what was it, was it uh, mm. uh, difficult? Yes, at times I think it was very difficult to, to, to live with that. In particular, the problem is always, and I think you will, that's where it's difficult to take these risks. If, if you take a risk, but you can control the execution, that's kind of okay for me. I, mm. But if there is 20 to 30 percent, which is not directly under your control, so which is sitting with a regulator or sitting with some lawyers who are keep keep fighting you from the competition, that that, that mm. that's a bit difficult. Yeah. And so my advice is, if you expect that, if you take a risk, that 40 percent of it or 50 percent of it is going to be external, don't do it. But if it's, you know, most of it is within your own, you know, remit. Mm. I think you should do it, especially yeah. when you are a number one or a leader, then you should yeah. just go for it. Yeah. Yeah. As you uh, said, the biggest risk is no taking no risk at all. Well, that's changing. the other point. You know, that's the yeah. other point. In, in hindsight, some of my competitors have taken more risk by just using lawyers and not differentiate with the mm. network. Mm. Because they could have at any point in time start changing their tactic and actually start moving forward. Um, just, just quickly on decision making, it's a very small but practical point. <laughs>
you know, you're the guy that's making the decisions as to where to invest you know, the, the money. You're obviously, you've got your community. But do you decide these big 1.4 million pound a day investment network decisions on gut? Or is that, no, as you said, no, purely no, financial? No, no, of, no, no, of course not. I mean, you can't. I mean, uh, then I wouldn't be here. Uh, uh, no, you, 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 you have to have a plan. Of course, you have a yeah. we have a very solid financial plan. We have made some really big financial commitments to the analyst community that I need to, uh, that, that are the principles. You know, I need to get to 25% margin. I need to get three and a half billion in synergy. So I have some very, very clear guidelines. Yeah. And then, you know, we spend a tremendous amount of time with the technology teams, with the IT teams to make sure that we have the right plan. Uh, and the right financials yeah. behind it, and then uh, you know we discussed it with the shareholders, and uh, we're able to get the approvals. Olaf, um, just a f one or two last questions for me, then we can open it up to uh, to the floor. Um, but you mentioned there about in your presentation about the putting the focus on the customer, and as you said, yeah. a lot of organisations have you know, as a mantra, we're customer centric, but it's difficult to actually live and breathe it. You mentioned that point. So if I can just bring you back to that, how realistic, how, how practically, I mean, all of the competitors, as you said in your sector, say, the, you know, customer experience yeah. or customer insight, whatever it is, that's how we differentiate. But how do you actually live and breathe that to make sure you are customer centric? Well, so the first thing I said was, was to, to spend time there. And I think that helps. And then the second thing, which I find very difficult uh, at times, is you, you, you have to sometimes take difficult decisions between time to market and, and customer experience. So, so sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we had a recent example where we introduced a new to phone in the market. And our technical people told us, well, this is maybe not really going to be good. And uh, yeah, you have to make this trade-off. The tr people are trained. The advertising is already planned. It's hard sometimes, really hard to make those hard cuts. So, and I think you need to be at times courageous and say, okay, no, we, we, we don't do this. Mm -hmm. And it might have a negative financial impact in the short term. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I find difficult is to make those trade-offs. Yeah. The way I've dealt with it is I've got a person in my team. I have a person, uh, Jackie O'Leary, who is um, representing those issues. So she represents those issues in the board. And, and she has a veto, so she, she, she is allowed to say, you know, guys, you cannot do this. This will have too big an impact. And by bringing customer experience into the board, mm. by someone who is not uh, in a functional position, but in a, in, in a real operational role, so she is in, mm. a, in an operational role, uh, I think you, you, you can work through those issues. Yeah, you can work through those issues. Yeah. Um, and final question for me, y you've, you mentioned that you came over to this country and you're challenging the assumption of the network here. You're putting new yeah. benchmarks in saying that it just isn't acceptable. Uh, you went in and you sort of saw this, saw this school card of red, yeah. amber and green and you challenged the assumptions there. So challenging the assumptions is what is acceptable uh, is one of those you know, traits of great organizations and great people. So how do you make sure that your culture is constantly doing that and you are challenging the assumptions? to make sure you're, you're making yeah. big improvements? Um, it's a good question. I don't know, actually. <laughs> I haven't got uh, an answer for it. That's why I'm asking. Uh, <laughs> do I challenge? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, you, by, by, by establishing this value around being bold, we try to allow, to, to give people permission to think out of the box. Yeah. And we allow people to come forward with sometimes, uh, you know, some crazy ideas. and. <laughs> Uh, and and to, to challenge the status quo, we, we, we try to do that. We try to bring that in through the values that we, are, uh, that we have implemented. Mm. And the advantage we had, which is sometimes difficult, you know, when you are in an infrastructure business, I thought it was actually quite logical to start challenging the status quo because this country has to work on its infrastructure. I mean, mm. I was amazed, you know, sometimes I'm sitting in a train and uh, I, f I drive to the north and you get this excuse, we're going to be late because there are leaves on the trains. You know, I, I, I could not believe it when I heard it the first time. Now I get used to it now. So, and I, Very big leaves. I or, or the, <laughs> you know, all this, uh, the, 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 the one that I even taped because I thought this one I think is the most, the most interesting one was the, the water infrastructure. I mean, you, you must remember this one where 
was the, the person, um, probably for very good reason, who was representing the water infrastructure in the UK, or I don't know, one of the big organizations. And he said, you know, it has to rain from now until the last day of the year, 24 by 7, and then maybe we have enough water <laughs> to, to serve the society. I, thought, I, I, mean, I mean, people have to stand up and say, my God, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Or take Heathrow. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, when you fly, I mean, Heathrow, every time you go to Heathrow, the first thing that goes through my mind, oh my God, I'm going to be late to this meeting. Um, you know, <laughs> this country has to do something about these problems. It's funny because we were, we were in drought all the way up until the end no, of I September. Know. And we had a Vietnamese monsoon every day. It was raining like crazy. And, <laughs> and we were not allowed to water our, or to, 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 yeah. <laughs> to clean our cars, you know. It's <clears throat> and I think that this is something uh, interesting about this society that you... Yeah you accept that infrastructure. We need to do something about that. Yeah. Well, we, 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 need, we need things to complain and moan about, right? I mean... No, you need to... <laughs> it's not so difficult to do it. I mean, it takes a bit... Uh, it takes a few years. Mm. But at least what I can say is that on the digital infrastructure side, I'll make sure that with my company, this country will get an infrastructure that we are proud of. That's what I want to have here. And when I started here, the infrastructure in my space was running behind the US, Korea, Sweden, many countries, now the infrastructure that's already here in London and in 10 other cities is an infrastructure that is better and bigger than in any other city in Europe. And afterwards, I want to try to get an infrastructure that is beating some of these countries that are a bit the poster child in terms of di digital infrastructure. The poster child in the, in the world today is Korea. So Korea, I don't know if you know, they have the advantage that it's a small infrastructure, a small country, and secondly, that everyone lives in apartments. So you. Yeah. It's easier to build a digital infrastructure for everyone. But I, I think we can, uh, we, my company can certainly make a big contribution to the digital infrastructure, big contribution. Thank you very much, sir. Brilliant. OK, so if we can, on that note, open it up to the floor. Hi, I'm Rotem. I have two questions. One, how do you uh, generate or foster this openness of your employees to actually provide you feedback? And the other one, what's your vision for the telecommunication industry as a whole that we see that everybody is actually showing really poor numbers? Right. So on the first mm -hmm. one is um, uh, to foster an open um, environment is, of course, to, to, to lead, lead, lead by example. So, so, so is to be really open, is to engage with different people. The, what my... The way I, I do this is I try to go through all the ranks without removing accountability. So I think there are some, if you, if you, it, you don't want to be a micromanager. So you, you don't want to be the leader that comes in and Mr. the fix it. Yeah? You come in, you fix it, and you bypass everyone else. But I see it as my right as the CEO to pass all the management to ask questions, to engage, to learn, and to motivate but I'm not allowed to remove accountability. So th that, that's what I try to do. So as an example, what did I do today? I, I, had, a, I had a breakfast with 20 employees you know, from the company, from anywhere else, to share, learn, and to, to, to live that. Um, on your second question is, you know, I think this industry is a little bit underrated, in particular by the investors, and a lot of investors and shareholders, I mean, frankly, mm. Also, um, no, I'm not going to say that because I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> but what I will say is that uh, I, think, I think it's an underrated industry. It's an industry that is incredibly exciting. It's an industry that moves very, very quickly. And it's one of the rare industries where we produce a product which is intrinsic in people's life. It's so intrinsic in people's lives that they use it all the time. They're really upset when it doesn't work. And you know, if I ask each one of you to pass on your phone to someone else and say, you know, it's just a commodity, so just pass it on and let the other person use it, I think most people would feel extremely uncomfortable because you have your personal data. So it's a really exciting industry. It's a really exciting industry. And I think we have an opportunity to, to you know, to rebuild some of the value in this market. The issue for this industry is, which is a little bit similar to the airlines industry, is that there are a lot of operators around the world and there is a very, very big focus on making sure that the pricing 
is right, which is good. I think that is important because so many people use it. But there is so much, foc so much focus on pricing that mm. the, uh, you know, in Europe nowadays, you have 163 operators and you have only one Apple and one Google. So it gives you an idea. And we have to invest in the network and we need to invest every year 10% of our revenue to, to just, you know, make sure that it works. So that's one of the issues we have as an industry, that the regulatory framework is not very investor uh, and company friendly today. And I don't blame the regulatory framework. It's also part of our own making. I mean, we should create more excitement and we should solve some of the problems that do exist, like roaming and other things. Um, but that's, 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 I would say, uh, uh, how I see it. Hmm? Thank you. We've got another question uh, right here, please. Hi, Sophie speaking. Just one second. Um, I just wonder what you see as the future kind of business model, really, in your industry, and whether you think it's going to massively change, whether data is going to be where your, the bulk of your revenue comes from, or whether you think it's going to be a, a data or, or a B2B kind of business model, and how you see that kind of changing over time. Right, so uh, it's increasingly <laughs> an excess fee model. So. What that means is that there will be, you know, similar to, I guess, Neil, Neil who was here before me, uh, a, a subscription model. In the UK in particular, there's still a lot of customers that are what we call them prepay products. We think that over time it will be much more a subscription and where most of the revenue will have to come from the subscription fee. You will have less and less what we call out of bundle. Um, uh, also because, well, there's different reasons for that, but the, um, and that that subscription fee is fundamentally a price for a set of services around data. Because even a telephone conversation on a 4G network next year will be a data transaction. Now, the customer will not notice it, there's no difference, mm -hmm. apart from the fact that you can enrich voice again by uh, deploying video conferencing or by making you know, uh, high definition, you can do a lot of things by bringing it to a data uh, 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 system. So the subscription and overall it will be a data business. Thank you. Olaf, as the pioneer of 4G in this country and clearly uh, organizations got a lead, I'd like to ask you a question similar to the one I asked Neil Burkett, which is this. Right now I know from looking at my own sons that uh, they no longer have landlines at home all their voice calls are taken yep. on the mobile, they wouldn't dream of having a landline, mm. uh, except for internet access. Mm -hmm. However, once you've experienced 4G and what it does on your, your dongle yeah. or iPad or whatever, why would I n bother to keep a fixed <laughs> line? So what did Neil say then? Eh? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, he did the usual story, of course, we need backhaul and we need this and we need all this. Which is stuff. right, by the way. Which, which, right, which yeah. is true. But yeah. I also said, my view is that in the end, I will have a single device at home, which is a modem, which is a Wi-Fi access point, which is also mm. a small cell yeah. on your network. And that way I get the advantage of, mm. depending on what content or what type of thing I was doing, the intelligence in the system will decide how it will deliver it to me to optimize the cost and therefore provide a better return for the operator to give me all the services that I want. Excellent answer. <laughs> Just answer my own question. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, we have a, a, a fixed business as well, and we're going to grow that. It's going to become very important. Um, we have rolled out fiber, or we are not rolling out fiber, BT does that, but we're selling and marketing and servicing fiber product. I do not believe that 4G is displacing um, fixed necessarily. It will only do that when fixed is not good. So we have seen that in Austria, we have seen that in, in this country in rural areas where there is no fixed. So there definitely 4G will, will serve the purpose. Um, so I think there is a place for both, but both have to show their merit and, and their differentiation in the eyes of the customer. And then I agree with you that to the customer ultimately it doesn't make a big difference anymore. It, the device will you know, a 4G device next year will basically, you know, be able in the home to use a Wi-Fi signal uh, and make a, 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 you can make a phone call via Wi-Fi uh, router or via a fixed internet or via a 4G capable product. And then exactly as you said, <coughs> depending on the load, depending on what's going on, 
the device or the network will select which route to take. The customer will not be uh, worrying about that, and they don't need to be worrying about that. So that's, in my view, the direction that it takes. I can tell you, again, without marketing the service, but the 4G service is very exciting because most of the people don't know what you can do with it until you have seen it. And I, I and then you don't go back. You know, you don't go back and use something. Oh, it's, it's very interesting. You get used. It's the same thing. Like, try to remember when you didn't have a mobile phone. How did you work? It's kind of. I mean, I don't remember it exactly. And it's, but it worked somehow. You worked through it. But it, you cannot imagine now living without that particular tool. And the same is true with 4G. You can do so much more. So much more. You basically bring the whole fixed, a good fixed experience that you may have in the home or in the office, you bring that out, outdoor, on the road, in restaurants, in, you know, it, everywhere. I mean, there is this <coughs> interesting <laughs> debate about indoor versus outdoor coverage. I will not, I will, again, I will, I will not go into too much detail on that, but uh, uh, our uh, 4G will provide very good indoor because it's using a very dense grid. Thank you very much indeed. We have, uh, do we have time for one final question? One final question, if it's a good one, sir? <laughs> no, pressure. no pressure at all. Thank you for that. I was relaxed until about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, David Rayburn from HP. Um, Hi. There's been a lot of uh, talk in the market about over-the-top services uh, like WhatsApp and so on, especially recently now. Yeah. How are you going to either <coughs> work with or compete against these services that are taking your pie? Everything you're saying mm. makes absolute sense about the importance of the network, yeah. the speed yeah. and so on. But you have these guys who are making, I would even say, more money off of it than you possibly can. So what's your sort of strategy in changing mm -hmm. your service to not fall in the trap of delivering a pipe for everyone okay. to spend money on? So the first thing that we're doing is we're bringing all the things into a subscription. So we have announced unlimited voice and unlimited text. It's the best way to, to, you know, to remove this anxiety of people to say, I need to use WhatsApp or something because I get this extra charge and I have a per second or per minute or per transaction charge. And that has worked very well in the UK, by the way. Um, uh, so WhatsApp is important. It, it, it is important, but it's certainly not as important as in the Netherlands or in Italy or other places where the uh, telcos have been too late in promoting and driving very large um, abundance in their, in their products and services. So that's one way to do it. And then the second thing that we will do is we will bring very selectively, very selectively, because we're not Apple, we're not Google, we're not a software company. But through partnering, we will, we will bring some services to the market, which will, uh, I think, uh, excite you and others, which will compete with some of these products. So on behalf of everybody here, I want to say, Olaf, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>